Okay, three o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel here at Think Tech, and we have Mark Duda with us. I want to just say a few words before I say actually hello to Mark. <laughs> Take a flash on Mark, so we can see who we're talking about. That's Mark Duna. Okay. <clears throat> so he got into the energy business pretty early, uh, in, in my view of it. I mean, 2008, you know, and that was, that was the year, if you recall, of the great agreement. There was the agreement to agree, so to speak. Yep. <laughs> the great energy agreement under Linda Lingle, it really, it did change things. It, it did, you know, it was the nod. It was the governmental nod to energy. And he worked his buns off for the next several years, I mean, I'm sure still. And when we started getting active on the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and had all these events, legislative briefings, you know, in January and Energy Day, Mark was very active in that. And he was active in the Solar Energy Association uh, for several years anyway. And those were the heady days. Those were the days. Everybody was sort of coming together on energy with so much action, so much excitement. Uh, gee, I remember, and, and I got to know early that Mark, Mark was really dedicated to this. That, that he, that it, it was his, his life was intertwined with energy, and thus it will always be with Mark Duda. I can't imagine him in any other context. <laughs> the other thing is really smart, really articulate, and I learned early that he's a leader in this area. But we haven't seen him in a couple of years, and so it's really delightful to have him back. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks, Jay. It's great to be back. <laughs> it's probably a good time to catch up. It is. Let's catch up. You know, in those days, uh, I'm talking four or five years ago, um, it seemed like we were all in the boat together. Uh, at least I saw it that way. Maybe you did too. And we were all working, you know, toward this really exciting goal. We didn't have this, uh, you know, 20, 2045 thing at the time, but, but there was a really exciting goal of, of putting clean energy everywhere, changing our, changing our state. And, uh, and people took note, not only in the state, but outside the state. And the personalities and the organizations involved, the stakeholders, if you will, of Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, um, you know, uh, I thought that we would all grow old together and that we would we'd be involved in moving, this, moving the ball ahead and, and creating a new world here in Hawaii. But little by little, and I'm sure you saw the same thing just in your view about it, um, little by little, that, that you couldn't sustain that, that view because People were coming and going. Organizations were changing and coming and going in the government. You know, the two-year cycles in the House of Representatives, my goodness, they don't know what the last guy knew. You taught the last guy about it, but now somebody else comes in and he doesn't know so much, you have to reteach him. And so the legislative cycle, political cycle, you know, sort of mm, changed things. And uh, changing personalities, it was like a, a great big um, musical chairs kind of affair. <laughs> where at the end of the day, look around and the guys you thought we were going to get old with building energy, they weren't there anymore. Uh, and then you wonder, can we still do this? Uh, who is around? Who remembers? It's, and I always said that Hawaii has a bad case of uh, us can't remember. Um, and maybe well, we can't in this area. So what has your experience been like, you know, from the heady days when you started 2008? You're, you know, you're, you were a founder of Revolution, now you're with uh, uh, DEP, Distributed Energy Partners, uh, doing uh, solar, but more than solar. I know you do more than solar because you're that kind of guy. Um, what, what has it been like for you? What, what kind of mm, trends and evolutions have you seen, could you observe in your, in your uh, you know, profundity? Well, I mean, you've said a lot there, and uh, it's a little bit challenging to respond, but I, I think one of the kind of key ways that I think about the last, you know, coming on 10 years is is you know in those early days when in some ways it did seem to be different was that because it was different or because we had a snapshot into what was inherently a historical process i mean i think that's been proven right like things change and evolve over time and they have and you know when i got into this we were we were trying to figure out if the grid could handle you know one percent of the customers having pv let's say and you know now we're at somewhere north of 20 percent that kind of thing and so the questions have changed <clears throat> um, 
And so, uh, you know, I just think that there, the, that on one hand, there's more perspective to be had in terms of integrating non-utility owned renewable energy of all different sizes into the utility grid and the implications that that has for everybody. But at the same time, not everybody has all of that history. And I think this is one of your other points is some people that have, you know, kind of were involved then and got out of it before they'd seen different aspects of the cycle. And some of the people doing it now, you know, weren't around for those early days. So it does make it challenging to kind of pick through and see what's really going on and to really have a sensibility for, you know, what certain changes that may happen now mean in the context of everything that came before and where they may be pointing us to the future. So, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I totally take your point. I think about a lot of the same stuff. Well, I mean, some, some of the bumps and grinds in the road here is, uh, you know, soon after the, the beginning of this period we're talking about, there was contention. There was contention uh, by the solar installers, of which you were in, you were in that group, um, against the utility because the utility didn't want so much solar. Um, there was contention with the regulators who were, mm, I think, under political pressure one way or another, and the legislature under political pressure. Everybody was lobbying everybody about everything. Um, and, and that never got settled. I'm talking about large picture. It never got settled. And then, what, uh, not quite two years ago, um, in walks the next Terra deal, yep. uh, which was, uh, you know, talk about distraction. I mean, in, in, the, in the fullness of the historical events we're talking about, that was a huge, uh, I would say that was a $4.3 billion distraction. Yep. Everybody stopped. It was like, stop the world, I want to get off. And, and nothing happened. I mean, everybody was like waiting to see which way the wind was blowing, keeping options open, waiting to see. And now it's over. And now we have a moment of peace, maybe not so many distractions. And we try to figure out which direction we were going, uh, how that may have changed in the past couple of years, which direction we should go now. And we look around and we see that, you know, solar may not be the, the, the cure-all that it was. Hawaii may not be the leader that we thought it was going to be. Yep. Well, I think you know maybe there's three different points in there. Um, I like those the, complex let, let questions. Me, yeah. The, <laughs> the, to the distraction point, I think you know that's unambiguous. That was clear before the commission agreed to hear that case. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but a number of organizations that were interveners in a lot of the relevant dockets that are going to determine the state's energy policy going forward filed a motion with the commission saying, hey, you need to figure out the DERS docket, the coupling docket, the power supply improvement plan docket, and I, th I forget what the other one was, but there's four of them, you know, so that we know what the state's energy policy is, and, and even ultimately in fairness to Nextera, so they can see if they want to be a part of what the state decides is going to be the public interest around the electric power sector going forward. And, uh, in, you know, and, you know, here's all the problems that will happen if we don't do that. And instead, you know, we heard the case and we're exactly right back where we were before. And, of course, we have a new chair now. And what's he done within the last couple of weeks said, hey, we really now that we got this thing out of the way, it sucked all the air out of the room, but we really need to get back to these four dockets, uh, like I say, which was clear to a lot of the people that were kind of deeply involved in this beforehand. So mm -hmm. to that point, to your 100% your uh, agreement on the distraction point and the, the, the sad part of it is that you could have known this beforehand and probably saved Nextera a lot of trouble as well as, you know, regulators and the interveners well, in those dockets. Well, you think it was the right reject it? I do. Um, for that reason, which is that we don't want to make the state's energy policy in the context of what Nextera wants. We want to make that and determine what's in the public interest and then see who wants to kind of orient to that. And, and, you know, obviously in the middle of their bid, which was based, you know, in a substantial way around LNG, the state decided it wanted 100% renewables, you know, essentially in the same relevant time frame where you would recover the cost of that LNG investment. So, you know, if you're on the next era side, you would say, hey, this isn't really matching up with our plans very well. Um, I mean, you couldn't help but, but think that. But, but I, you know, this isn't meant to be an anti-Nextera point. It's a governance point. I mean, you, you should, they shouldn't have been put in that position. They shouldn't have been allowed to put themselves in that position when it was really clear two years ago what the state needed to do, which was to figure this other stuff out and then see who wanted to support that, you know, that version of the public interest. Couldn't, you know, I mean, I, and I dwell on this issue myself. Couldn't the state have regulated Nextera, one way or the other, into following state policy. I mean, wh why, why, do we, why do we have so little confidence in our ability to regulate a company to comply with state policy? Well, I think we see evidence of 
of government's inability to regulate, you know, all over the economy and the healthcare sector. <laughs> and, you know, so I mean, it's almost like the opposite question: is why would you think you'd be successful? And, and not, you know, not not intended to be pejorative toward anyone in government. It, it on some level, it's an unequal playing field, and the rewards t to the company of winning that battle. Um, you know, are much higher than they are to government, and so people act accordingly. It's kind of like microeconomics 101. But, so well, but things have changed now for, for you, for the solar industry. Yeah. I mean, it was really gangbusters there at the beginning, and it was a, you know, a ripe pomegranate for everybody involved. And I, it's just a thought I want to share with you. I had this thought driving in, and that is this. You know, at the outset, this was so attractive, and it was, could, be, could be so profitable but 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 the, what I think what the solar industry forgot was that it needed to it needed to understand and sympathize with the common good rather than profit per company or for the trade the industry itself, and that had had the um, had the solar installers looked further and I think you did actually look further to the common good, uh, it would have been a more credible force in the conversation and it would have taken us to a better place. We'd be in a better place now if the industry had been looking to the common good. Well, I mean, I don't want to argue that everything the solar industry has done over the last decade has Not been great, that. but, but I, I actually really disagree with the point you're making. And I would say that that largely reflects the story that utility has been trying to sell through various outlets over that period. Um, you, you know, and the, the reason why in my view, this is this isn't well. First of all, on the solar industry side, right? I mean, the the a lot of the arguments about where the common good is being harmed, you know, have no basis in any kind of empirical research or even sort of theoretical grounding. They're just things that get said over and over and over and haven't been examined. And again, you could argue that at some point the commission should have looked at this question in a methodologically robust and defensible way, and then we'd at least have a realistic answer to sort of orient around. So that's a solvable problem. We just haven't, as a state, set out to, to what, solve what it. What about but the end of uh, NEM, NEM? Was that was that a good move or not? Well, it, uh, you know, from the perspective, the, I mean, the most recent thing I've seen on this was by Jim Lazar, who I'm sure you know, saying essentially that, that NEM lowered costs for ratepayers in the state. Uh, he didn't say that no that any amount of NEM going on forever would have that result, but that was the result of his empirical analysis, looking at actual data from this state. So, you know, I don't think you, I don't think you see that anywhere else, you know, prior to his analysis, somebody like actually doing math to show that that, that kind of result. And it's not like he's doing that on the behalf of the solar industry. He's just an inter you know, someone who wants to get energy mm. policy right in the state. Mm. So, you know, that being said, I think the question is really, if you wanted to change the way distributed generation gets interconnected, how would you do that? And in my view, the, what the commission did is, is, uh, is, is not uh, inherently problematic or wrong. I think there's other things that they could have done, but, but from a theoretical perspective, they had a, a logically coherent plan, but the way that they implemented in the, the decision in the DERS docket last year was just inadequate. And, and what I mean by that is you say, hey, here's, what, rightly or wrongly, here's the problems that we perceive with distributed generation and the opportunities that we perceive around it is, first of all, at a certain point, it's going to ex there's going to be too much power exported from these systems onto the grid. So we've got to do something about that. Uh, we're concerned that people are being overcompensated for putting power onto the grid. We're concerned about that. And conversely, if we could only make all these people that keep wanting to buy net metered PV systems buy batteries, then we could save the utility from having to make investments in ancillary service providing technologies that could be done from all these distributed systems. And so why don't we try to solve all those problems at once and basically drive the market toward these self-supply systems, which essentially two-thirds of which I think in their view were going to be residential systems with substantial amounts of batteries that would allow people to serve their own load during the day and at night to a significant extent by providing power out of the batteries. Sounds like a good idea. It does sound like a good idea. And like I say, I'm not trying to sit here and criticize that idea. However, 
what's bad about the way they implemented what was, again, not an inherently bad idea, was that they didn't specify the pricing that allows you to calculate the, the value or the economics around that investment. So how much are you going to be paid, if anything, for providing these ancillary services at your house? Because it does limit the amount of power that you're going to get out of these batteries that you bought. So should you buy them or shouldn't you buy them? Well, I don't know, because some of the variables in the math problem I'm trying to compute don't exist. And so to specify something like that without those variables variables is a mistake. Second thing is when you really want that power to be supplied or for the utility not to have to supply that power is in the evening peak. And the, what the commission said is, hey, we want some time of use rates, not the time of use periods are five to nine and the pricing is going to be like this. And n not only is that what you're going to be charged if you use power at that time, but you can actually be paid more for supplying power to the grid during that time. So you would think that you would want to use the leverage, the resource of, of people like you and me buying systems at our houses to flatten the load curve and reduce the cost of supplying power to everybody. They didn't do that. And then they also said, and the way we're kind of thinking about it is that you'll need to supply these grid supportive services potentially as a quid pro quo just for interconnecting at all, but then they didn't say which ones. And so I'm not sitting here trying to say this was an easy problem to solve, but at the same time I am saying that if you wanted to sort of radically transition from a system which is buy a PV system, put it on your house, export whenever you want, use power whenever you want, to one that said never export, buy some batteries, and you know, supply services to the grid, you need to sort of think it through and detail it out better. And so that's what we got last October, October 12th, in, in essence. And uh, I would say it's still not really worked out to the point where people can make sound investment decisions around mm -hmm. a decision that's a lot different than, than what it used to be. And you can throw in the fact that over that same period, oil's gone down. So the cost of waiting to invest in a system like that has gone down and, and that kind of thing. Market so, forces. Yep. I told you about Mark. He really is Akamai about this stuff, very thoughtful and articulate. We're going to take a minute and think about what he said, try to integrate that into our brains. And we're going to come back when I ask him, what would he do now? <laughs> Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what's likable about science. Aloha. Ehana Kako is here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network because we need to take a dispassionate look at the issues. Here in Hawaii, we need to understand what's going on in the economy, in the public sector and the private sector, what's going on in terms of schools and with the people whom we love and see every day. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, proud to be part of Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll see you here every Monday at 2 o'clock p.m. Aloha. Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. I am Ina Chang. I am the guest host for Small Business Hawaii with Reg Baker. Tune in every Thursday at 2 p.m. and watch us. Aloha. We're back. We're live, and now we're gonna now we're gonna actually figure all this out with Mark Duda of Distributed Energy Partners. We've been around, in and around the clean energy uh, initiative, uh, really from the, the, its beginning in the current iteration. Um, like, and we're calling this show, what are we calling this? Um, <clears throat> plan B, life after next era. And we're going to ask him what is, what is his plan B uh, to move ahead on this. But let me throw some elements, sure. sort of based on what we were talking about before and during the break. So it seems to me this is ultimately a question of technology. I mean, we got to deal with the technology. We've got to be smart about dealing with technology. It's not only the PV technology, which is pretty mature already, <clears throat> but it's technology of the, of the black boxes uh, that, you, know, uh, that you, you put on a smart grid, and it's the technology of the batteries, and it's all that software that can and should be devised in order to control all that and make it work together. <clears throat> so really, it's a technological question. And, and so why haven't we done more up till now? We could have black boxes. We could have smart grid. We've been talking about smart grid for the longest time. And batteries are out there. Yes, they're expensive. And yes, you know, Marco Mangelsdorf in his article said they cost about as much as the system itself, as the PV system itself. So effectively, it doubles the cost of your system. But it's critical. It's critical for the community. So why can't we find a way to incentivize and cause the structures you know, uh, in the community, in the energy community, 
to put all this in place and move forward? I think the, the context for that question and for what you said that it, 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 you know, it's the most fundamental thing is technology. I would say that there's one thing even more fundamental, which is the business model of the utility. And so I think that's sort of the point from which everything else is ultimately going to emanate. And, uh, and so I think if you had a utility with a different business model, then you know, you'd get different sets of policy issues. You'd get probably different sources of agreement and disagreement among the different players than you have now. And you'd get a different sort of pace of technological adoption and that kind of stuff too. So talk about what change in business model you well, have in mind. I mean the thing that you hear a lot is that the coupling has sort of severed the link between the utility wanting to sort of buy and own things like generating assets um, and, and their remuneration for doing that. But it, it isn't really like that because you still periodically have these rate cases where you sort of reset that compensation level. And so the thing that I think that like the fundamental question in utility regulation in the state is, is when we are going to sort of acknowledge and confront and really get into addressing the fact that we can't have a utility that makes money by buying things and expect them to not want to do as much generation, transmission, distribution, and everything else they can as possible. And so, you know, if, some, if we think that that's in the public interest, then we should leave the regulatory model the way it is. If we're trying to get somewhere else, then we need to change it. And by change it, I mean we need to put them in a position where they can do as well as they, as they can and as they need to do and as they can go to their shareholders to whom they have a fiduciary responsibility, you know, with a clean conscience and say, this is a great plan for us, but they have to make money by doing something different. I mean, and it's literally at the level of IBM not making computers anymore and going into consulting services, that kind of thing. So they need to do things like manage the grid and, you know, at the, at the end of the day, and I'm not talking tomorrow, if you want to sell some kilowatt hours to someone else, they, you know, you need to be able to do it and they need to be able to make money for enabling that type of transaction. And so, you know, eventually we're going to get there just because the sheer weight of technology will ensure that, that, you know, stuff developed elsewhere eventually lands here, but that could be 30 years, but we should be talking about it like tomorrow and trying to get there. Otherwise, I think we're going to be stuck in this cycle. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to be stuck in this cycle where, uh, you know, they are, are motivated based on their regulatory incentives to want things that are different than most of the other stakeholders and that, in my view, aren't in the public interest. And mm -hmm. so you're going to get them wanting to own power plants that make power in an evening peak. And they're going to, at the end of the day, want a relatively high peak because it justifies more power plants, where what's in the public interest is a really, really flat load curve. Yeah. You're not talking about uh, co-ops, I notice. You haven't said a uh, word about co-ops. Oh, I don't think that a co-op is inconsistent with that or that it means you'd automatically land in that world. It's just an, it's an ownership model that, that is you know, ne probably in some ways neither more or less consistent with that regulatory model than, than other ones. I think, you know, I'm certainly not an expert on this, but there's, you know, co-ops come with a different set of advantages and disadvantages than mm. an investor-owned utility for sure. You're just talking um, about the, the entity, whatever it is, yeah, how has to be differently incentivized exactly. so they're not looking to make money on things we don't need. On, well, on more of things that we do need than we could get away with. Yeah, okay. So, so, uh, so I give you a lot of people who'd like still to put PV on their roofs. Yep. I'd like to, you know, and I give you a utility that, like to, that likes to make, um, uh, should like to make uh, uh, utility scale PV farms and turbine, wind turbine farms. Um, we, we, we have the opportunities to develop an awful lot of renewable energy, but what's missing uh, is the technology. Um, I mean, and I go back to uh, the batteries. Uh, some, I mean, people have all kinds of different views about this. I'm interested in yours. Where should the batteries be? Should they be at the homeowner? Should they be at the utility? Should they be at both places? And how do you talk? How do you have them talk to each other? Uh, and this, this, I don't mean to sidestep your point about uh, you know the, uh, the the monetary model, yep. but just in terms of the efficiency of the entire system, yep. um, and assuming that there still will be a utility. Uh, that it's relevant to, to connecting us all and making our our electric community work. Yep. Um, where do you put the where do you put the renewables and where do you put the batteries? I think you put both in both places. I mean, not to try to dodge the question, but but the optimal system probably has utility scale storage where that's needed, and it also has storage at, you know at the individual house level. And you know how much of each you get is going to be a response to the price signals based 
by those consumers on the smaller scale and developers on the utility scale and the utility itself in terms of the regulatory model. But it just seems to me that, that you have the public willing to, to you know, sort of step up and buy things that historically have been bought by the utility and, and uh, you know, cost, the cost of that recovered from everybody. And, and you, you, know, you kind of sit there knowing that the public is willing to make this type of investment and it has spillover benefits that we really haven't tried to sort of monetize, not monetize, but try, try, haven't tried to bring onto the grid. And that like, uh, you know, the regulatory system going forward ought to try to focus on doing that. You know, and, and, and so in my sort of guesstimate here, once you've done a fair amount of that, you will, you will still be aware that there are places where you need to site storage on the grid, and uh, you know, that's the most cost effective way of, of making sure that you don't have some congestion on the transmission system or what have you, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, maybe I'm being simplistic about this, but uh, if, if I had a lot of um, utility scale, solar and wind and whatever else, I mean, I see those as the, the real possibilities, not anything else. Um, you know, both politically and technologically. Mm -hmm. um, and you have batteries that will cover the peak. Uh, why do we need generating systems at all? Can't we put the money into the batteries and move forward, you know, even faster than 2045? Uh, I don't think there's a technological reason why you couldn't do that. Um, you know, I think you want to optimize that investment, you know, like so from a PV perspective, the cost of solar panels is continuing to trickle down. But, uh, you know, if you wait 30 years and it comes down another 20 cents a watt, I, you know, you've lost more in that time period than you've saved by having the investment be cheaper. That isn't the case on the batteries. So there's some time in the next 20 years and maybe it's five years, maybe it's 10 years when you'd want to sort of say, okay, if I, you know, starting whenever we're going to build up and, and then eventually we're going to, you know, like the, the real central phase of that investment is going to hit, you know, in year you know, X, Y, and Z when we think that the price will have come down so that you optimize that investment decision the way that you do with any kind of investment like that. So I, I think that needs to be factored in. Um, you know, the, some costs are going up, labor's going up, land costs are going up in the state. Obviously, everyone's aware of that. Um, and probably there's more awareness of the O&M on the solar and wind system, so that, that's going up as well. One thing that we haven't talked about that's relevant here is that uh, you, know, you hear a lot about why the cost of utility scale generation in both solar and wind is higher here than on the mainland. And one thing I, ne I don't know much about the wind side of it, but I can speak to the solar side. And the thing that I never hear talked about is the risk premium that gets injected into the development process here just based on the fact that most of those deals end up dying. And so why Isn't would you, true? knowing what you know, put your money into a utility scale solar investment in the state right now when, I don't know, was it 14 out of 15 of the recent ones have died? Um, you know, some at the commission, some for different, you know, for other reasons, uh, you know, and some obviously from the utility having canceled them when in the case of the Sun Edison stuff. So it's just and that, and that's that, built that, into the price when, they, when it, they bid. And it, it, it has to be because, you know, investors aren't dumb and they look at what happens in here and most of these things don't get built. Right, so yeah. you, you don't put your money into something that has a whatever <laughs> nine, time, nine out of ten chance to fail, right? And and if, yeah, millions, and and then you lose it. So you have to build that in. It's only good business. Yeah, so my and view is that ha like you know half of those costs are just a Hawaii risk premium. There are things that are much more expensive that. here. Well, maybe we can. We should. I yeah. don't know if we can, but we should. Yeah. So um, my ultimate question, the show question for you, and we yeah. only have a minute or two left. Sorry, um, is what is your plan B? What do we do? What do we do first? What do we do intermediate? What do we do long term? Yeah, I think step one is the state needs to articulate you know, how it wants to get to 100% renewable. I'm assuming that we're not going to change that and 2045 is going to be, the, you know, more or less is going to be the year. So, so we need to figure out how we want to get there and that needs to be considered broadly. Uh, we need to figure out what the sort of spillovers outside the energy sector are of going this way or this way or this way, that type of thing. Then we need, once we know that, we need to look at what regulatory model is consistent with that outcome. And then we need to get the pricing right and being willing to tweak it. And, and I think that the problem will take care of itself, not that those three things are easy, but those are all doable. And, in, you know, and instead, we tend to focus on you know, what you would do if those things were already in place. Like then, you know, let's do this or let's do that. But if you just get this fundamental stuff right, it basically is going to drive itself in the direction you want. And 
you know, we've seen that with the solar industry where the panels got a lot cheaper and the cost of utility power went up and we had a supportive tax incentive and, you know, the thing took off like gangbusters. So, uh, you know, it, nobody, nobody was micromanaging it. It just worked because everything was pointing in one direction. And I think we can do the same thing with the whole electric power sector, but it's going to, you know, take a lot of political will and it's going to take a lot of leadership to kind of browbeat everybody into doing that but that's where i think we are and, that's and, what we and do. clever suggestions and clever incentives and, yep. and you know not controversy just clever clever and controversy Hopefully. you know yeah <laughs> it works better if you do clever yep. so i only have one more question would you ever consider government service uh i i haven't um you know i think my sort of position is, is or the, the, the place where I feel most comfortable is in policy analysis and so you know historically I've done that from outside of government but you know you never know right you never know but you'll come back right and we'll explore these things further as the as the ball moves forward yes absolutely thank you Mark sure Jay Mark Duda distributed energy partners and a longtime principal in the in the initiative for clean energy in Hawaii